questions. Otherwise, yeah. Again, Simon, thank you very much for joining us for another webinar. I think you've done how many now? Do you know? Are you keeping count? Quite a lot. I'm not keeping count. No, no, no. Yeah. That's for someone else to do. That's for my fan. Right. And they've obviously so far all been so successfully well received. Um, so, yeah, really appreciate you joining us again today. And over to you. Oh, yes. Perfect. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thanks for putting this together. Thank you for like of hosting it as always. Um, so this session is specifically about the use of longer lenses for street and documentary photography. Um, I'm basing this on my personal preference for using a 90mm for the majority of my work. Um, I think that because rangefinders are kind of classically associated with that kind of 35 to 50mm, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to go over and talk about what's possible with the, with the longer options. And then I think also my colleague uh, David has spoken about doing something uh, more along the, the 28 to 35 side of things. I'm not sure if that's in the works, but that could be a, a follow-up to this one. Um, in terms of telephoto lenses, in terms of the, the, the kind of technical side, I'm not going to go too far into the specifics because I, I prefer to talk about the practice. Um, but for those of you who are interested, um, on a technical mechanical level, a telephoto lens means that there's a telephoto group of elements in the lens. That means that the physical lens the, the length of it can be shorter than the focal length implies. So the rear, the rear element of a lens is normally what you talk about when it comes to focal length. If it's 50 millimeters away from the sensor, it's a 50 mil, if it's 90 millimeters away, it's a 90 mil. Um, by including a telephoto element, you're able to shorten that gap while, remain, while keeping the, um, the field of view. Um, this would be kind of contrasted against a long focus lens, which is, would be a much longer lens where the, the actual number does correspond with that distance. Um, but most people refer to long focus lenses and telephoto lenses as the same thing. So in practice, it, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, what telephoto lenses offer is usually a long reach and a small lens. Um, there are a few exceptions because it is, it is possible to have a telephoto wide angle. But generally, if you're talking about a telephoto lens, you're talking about something which is kind of a field of view of 75 millimeters and, and onward. Um, the characteristics of such a lens would usually be the, the reach, uh, the narrow angle of view, um, which means that you're usually looking at things which are further away from the end of the lens. Um, you're looking at compression, which means that things are, are kind of flattened out. Um, and you're looking at fall off or bokeh, or whatever you want to call it, um, even at like F22, if you're shooting something which is close up to you, you're still going to get quite dramatic fall off, um, which also means that you have to be very, very precise when focusing. For the, for the classic telephoto lenses on rangefinders, on the M rangefinders, um, you're looking at kind of three main options. You're looking at 75 millimeter, which is, I, I find that to be pretty close to 50, um, which means it's, it's, I think it's preferred as more of a portrait based lens. I usually recommend this to people who, um, you know, they're shooting with a 50 and they find they're always just a step too far or they've got a little bit too much negative space around the edges um, and they just want, you know, to take that step without actually stepping closer, go for a 75. 90 mil is my personal favorite. Um, I would shoot anything with this lens. I think it's a classic street and journalistic lens. Um, I would recommend looking at the work of Saul Leiter and Rene Barry because they also um, use this lens for quite a lot of their work. And then 135 millimeters is where you reach kind of the um, the limit of the range finder, which is, I think, in most range in most M cameras, what you'll find the limit to frame lines for. Um, I recommend that if you're going to use the 135, you use like an eyepiece of magnification. It's it's a decent enough uh, reach for most purposes, but when you when you look when you compare 135 with an SLR with what's what's possible with that kind of system, 135 is kind of the beginning of the telephoto range, and it's more of a mid. Um, whereas on a Leica, it's, it's kind of the extent of what the rangefinder can, can accommodate. Um, all three of these you're pretty much going to find as primes. Uh, I think rangefinder cameras are, you know, perfect for using prime lenses. That means that none of these are a zoom lens. You zoom and you frame by moving yourself with all of these. Uh, the benefit isn't about, it's not about um, keeping the camera to your eye and working through a zoom range. It's about you know, learning that length, pre-visualizing, moving through until, you know, the frame comes together in the viewfinder, not making the telephoto aspect work for you as a, as like a, um, as a crutch. 
uh, just in terms of the, the range of lenses that are offered in these different areas, there's the, the kind of budget entries in the Sumerit, which have a 2.4 to 2.5 aperture. There's some, some of the, the more compact, uh, which go down to F4 lenses. Um, there's the Elmerits, which are 2.8. And th those are kind of the, the classic lenses, um, which are all excellent. And then you have the more modern ones. There's the Summerlux and Noctilux versions of 75 and 90, which give you um, a different look and you, you have better light gathering, especially on film. Um, and all three of these 75, 90, 135 all come in an APO version. My preference is the APO. Um, I have the 90 APO. I've tried the 75, 135 APOs. Um, I think that they, they have the most versatile aperture in terms of F2 or 3.4 for the 135. Uh, the sharpness through the range is excellent, and for an everyday carry, they are pretty light. Um, you can get lighter, you can get heavier, but these are kind of, you know, just right for me. Um, in terms of the way that you're looking to frame with these, um, magnification of of, um, of the viewfinder usually comes in, in three uh, types, 0 0.58, 0 0.72, and 0 0.85. The 8.5 is probably the most ideal for using a telephoto lens, but they're less common. Uh, the 0 0.58 is best for wide angle work. Um, so if you're using 28, 35, 50, then the 0 0.58 is what you're looking for. But the 0 0.72 or the 8.5 um, are what I recommend. I think that the 0 0.72 is the most commonly used in current digital lens, that's the M10, the M10 monochrome, the M10R. Um, and I think it's also the standard in the, in the M6 and the MP. And because that's kind of the, the current or most recent range, that's what I tend to recommend to people who want to be shooting with these lenses. Um, you can also get magnification aids, which for me with glasses, you screw that into the viewfinder on the back and that you know, really helps you to see the frame um, because I know that for, for um, 35 millimeter and lower, I find it difficult to see those with, the, with my glasses and that kind of does inform my preference for using longer lenses in the first place. Um, a rangefinder is still, it's, it's still the most precise manual focusing mechanism. A rangefinder that's well calibrated will be more precise than any SLR with a focusing aid. Um, that's in my experience, and I've tried a lot of systems. Um, one of the best things about the rangefinder is that you focus the same at any aperture. You don't need to stop down to see things more clearly. So you can keep it wide open. Um, you're, you're looking at the rangefinder patch, which is the central part of the viewfinder, and that's either on, it's either dead on in focus, or it's not, or you're zone focusing. Uh, for long lenses, zone focusing is pretty difficult. Um, I recommend using the patch, keeping the camera to your eye and focusing critically, uh, but it is possible to zone focus, but it's difficult. Um, one of the best things about using the rangefinder with longer lenses is the freedom of vision. You're not making compromises because of like an arbitrary aperture you need in order to achieve focus. You're just looking at what you want to frame and then focusing and shooting it. You choose the aperture based on how you're going to imagine the, the, the end result to look um, and not because of a requirement of, of, uh, of an optical viewfinder. For the, for the wide aperture, long lens, manual focus, rangefinder is what you're looking for. Um, anyone who's used to a rangefinder system uh, with shorter lenses knows it's quite a short throw uh, to move from one end to the other. But with the, with the longer throw of a, of, a, um, of a longer lens, it means you have to turn the focusing uh, ring a little bit longer to get from minimum to maximum. Um, there are there are things like tabs which you can add to the lens which which helps with like muscle memory. Um, I tend to leave it at infinity, kind of at rest, and then I'm only moving it in one direction. And if I know that if someone's in the minimum focusing range, that's one to two meters, I can just swing it all the way around and then fine tune if I have the time. Uh, Pre-focusing is a great trick where you recognize that someone's moving in a certain direction, you focus on that point, and then you wait for them to hit the mark. Um, that's pretty good when subjects coming towards you. And for fast paced use, which is my preference, um, there are a few things that I'm always trying to be aware of when using longer lenses. Uh, the first thing is situational awareness. Before involving the camera, I'm always trying to figure out what's going on. How am I looking to identify my shots? What are the different things that I'm looking for? What's going on in front of me? What's going on behind me? The, the reason for this is that if you're looking with a longer lens, you're not looking at things kind of within a couple of feet with, from you you're looking quite, quite a bit further and then moving your way backwards towards you. So you're identifying characters, maybe in crowds, uh, maybe far away, where 
it's not going to be what's immediately in front of you. It'll be maybe working with layers to go behind that. So you've got to figure out exactly, you know, specifically what you want, because you're not going to get everything in kind of a shotgun approach with a wide lens. You're going to be going for one thing at a time. Um, I recommend practicing fast focusing um, before you need it. That means, you know, once you, once you have your lens ready, you can just sit in your room and practice focusing on things at different distances from you. That way you'll be ready that when those things are a, a distance from you in, you know, working in the field, you'll be able to just nail it every time. And the most important thing is that when you're using a long lens, you're using a much smaller piece of a much wider scene. So you have to be really discretionary about what you're going to include and what you're not going to include. If you have a much wider scene that's right in front of you, a wide lens will probably be necessary. But if you've got a wide scene where lots is going on, you can compress that into lots of individual pieces and then nail each of those with a longer lens. That's my preferred use case. Um, when you're using these lenses for kind of slower use, um, especially with the rangefinder, there's less parallax, which is excellent. That means that because the lens and the viewfinder are offset from each other, you sometimes get like a, a, a difference between what you're seeing in the frame and what you're actually photographing. With longer lenses at longer distances, you're, you can get more accuracy, which means you can make more kind of intricate angled compositions. Um, and also because of the compression, it means that you can really work in two dimensions. If you look at the, the, the image on this slide, it doesn't really go in in depth, but it goes in vertically, um, like a vertical stack of elements rather than a, a three dimensional stack, which is, you know, you get that more with 28 and 35 mil, where you're working with foreground, midground, background. This image has foreground, midground, background, but they work up and down rather than in and out. Um, one of the best things about the, um, the rangefinder system is the size and the portability. So even the longest of these lenses are pretty small. Um, on the SLR, you know, you, you have large bodies and potential for huge lenses. But with, with this workflow, the longest you'll be working with is, is a 135. Um, it's not, you know, for, because of that limitation, it's not the best at everything. I don't know many sports or wildlife photographers that shoot with Leica M, although they do exist. Um, although there, there's diverse use cases for the M system, it is iconic for a reason. And the reason is that like, these are the cameras and lenses to put in the hands of serious journalists. When you look at iconic Leica photographs, it's more than just a good photograph. It's that it's a historical photograph often. These, when, when working with the longer lenses for these applications, for these kind of street and photojournalism, um, Something it can offer is, is a, a maintenance of that kind of candid or non-disruption of scenes. You can work from much further away, although you still have to be fairly close. But those extra few steps give you that kind of, you know, candid element. Um, distance can often mean safety, uh, especially these days. Um, I think a lot of people are looking to, to work with longer lenses for their photography just because they want to keep a little bit of distance between themselves and other people, um, which means that you can put a 90 on your camera and treat it like a 35, but just, just by staying a little bit further away, but looking for the same frame. Um, I think just because there's a longer reach doesn't mean you have to be further away. You still need to be you know, pretty close to what's going on. But the, um, I think when it comes to my own work with 90, I think I'm mostly working with subjects between one and 10 meters away. Anything further than that is kind of a, a landscapey compositional shot, which I'm kind of moving away from. But if you look at the two, the two images on this slide, I was only, you know, a few steps away from these scenes. Um, but I think people assume that having that further reach on the lens means you have to necessarily position yourself further away, but it's, it's, it's more, it's just a different, it's a more decisive crop of that scene. You have to know exactly what you want in your frame. But if you're working with something wider, you have more of a shotgun approach. You end up maybe including things you didn't necessarily want to, whereas you can work with a lot more kind of minimalistic ideas and include much less, but in the right way. Uh, I also think that the flatter frame of a, um, of a long lens is quite different to what you see with people working like close and, and wide. You're not getting that kind of three-dimensional appeal in the same way. With, with kind of lots of different elements, you can work, um, you know, with the verticality or horizontalness of the frame. In two dimensions, I think if you look at these frames again, you can see that it's, even though there's depth in the one on the right, it's still quite a flat frame. 
Um, and I find that a good way to kind of study this kind of image is to look at uh, like frame panels from a comic book. I like to think of things because they work, you know, you've got the double page spread and it moves like that or it moves like that. You don't often get scenes where you're, you're using perspective in, in, um, in comics. So I think that's a useful resource. Uh, I also think that the idea of isolation, not, not isolation of the subject through like depth of field, but like a thematic isolation, because you're using tighter crops, you're isolating your image from that larger, larger scene. And I think thematically that can, that can work pretty well um, for storytelling photography. If you're looking to go any longer than this, any longer than 135, there are a few options. Uh, the Leica SL range um, has a 90 to 280, which is a spectacular lens. Uh, Leica R are film cameras, um, which have an extensive line, lens lineup. One of the ones I've played around with is the, is the 180. I think it's a 2.8, and that one's fantastic. And any of the um, current digital Leica M, and uh, you can use an adapter to put a vintage, you know, R lens or SLR lens on and use the live view. It's a little bit slower. And you won't be able to use the rangefinder, but for kind of landscape architectural work, it's, it's pretty interesting to play around with that. Uh, both of these frames were shot at 200 mil. Um, and I think it shows that you can use something much longer, you know, still with a busy scene on the right and, and quite a, an isolated busyness on the left. Um, but it's a more kind of decisive viewpoint on what I'm looking at. Whereas with a wide lens, these, these images would be, they'd have to be different images. Um, I think that covers everything I had to say. If anyone has any questions about about um, the use of these for any special purposes or any experiences or any questions at all, they can ask them now. Yeah, that's great. There's already a few questions coming in. Actually, I'm, I'm also quite interested by, by what you said by, you can almost like use, you could, you could think of using like a long lens, like a 90 mil as, as in within the same ways as you use a, like a, a wide lens, which mm -hmm. is interesting approach because I guess there's, there's that way of shooting where you just go out with a, that one lens trying to mm -hmm. get the, the mind frame of that lens or you're using a yeah. long lens um, you're pulling it out of the bag when you you need a longer reach for example I think there's a very there's very different approaches with those with, you see what I mean yes I think um so I, I actually originally I really didn't I didn't get along with with 90 mil very very well my the first one I owned was a, a 2.8 Elmerit thin version and I put up my camera took a few photos I was like why did I buy this this is silly and went back to like 50 mil and then after a while I was like no I've got to I've got to force myself to use this because there's there's something here it's a lens that you know classic photographers have used so I forced myself to use it for a few months and after a while it was the only lens I was taking out with me and it just kind of clicked in that time. It just kind of made sense. And I think, you know, sometimes you do have to have to try and use it as your only lens, try and look at not, this is the lens I have, so this is what I'm going to photograph with it. But you have to think, this is what I'm going to photograph. This is the lens I have. And this is how I'm going to go about doing it. So a lot of these images, you know, they're, they're tighter crops on wider scenes, which I would normally have applied, you know, a different eye to, but because I have to think about what am I going to include? So, uh, even this image on this frame, if I had 50, it would probably be the whole of the, the entirety of the person on top. And, you know, the, the two people below would be much further away. But because of the 90, I have to think, right, I'm going to compromise, just include the feet and include the, the people behind, but they'll, be, they'll feel closer because of the compression. And that way it gives me a bit more, it, it's a different frame to what I would have taken with a wider lens, essentially. I kind of feel like that's why, in a, in a way, that's why I've been put off because I've gone out with different lenses, say three, three lenses, and it's kind of put me at this point where I'm, I'm always unsure of which lens I should have on, on the rangefinder, and it's, it's in a way I've overcomplicated things, and I'm always Go worried. Out with one lens. Long lens on the body, um, but if I'm taking out of 75, mostly it's because I've been doing a portrait, so there's a specific purpose for it. Um, but it's yeah. quite interesting to think about going back to a telephoto lens and just using it for, you know, one approach. Yeah, I think you're 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 still working on the uh, on that Lee Valley series, right? Along the along the river, take a take a ninety and just yeah. use that. Good idea. Um, and yeah. I, I've um, I had an ask. I, I had a, a question. I, I think I get asked this more about film photography than specific lenses, but people will ask. You know, if you're if you're out and you're shooting with film and you see. X, Y, Z situation, how will you photograph it? The answer is I'll photograph it on film. You know, if I'm out and I see a situation, I've only got 90, 
guess what? I'm going to photograph it with my 90. Like there's no, I'm not going to not photograph it. I'm just going to be thinking differently. I'm going to use the space differently. Yeah. You know, if I have a 90 and something very wide is happening, I'll either try and pick out one detail from that wide scene or I'll run very quickly backwards while not flipping over and then I'll take it. But, I think that's one of the things. It takes quite a long time to find your distance with that lens. I mean, I just remember yeah. like, trying out the Q when the first Q was launched and I was very used to a 35, just going to a suddenly a bit wider. It threw me off totally and I was just always in the wrong position, it felt like. Um, but yeah, there's quite well, don't, don't get me started on 28 mil because we'll be here all day, but <laughs> yeah. it's, not, it's not my thing. Not thing. Um, but I did own the Q for a while and it is a spectacular camera, but I think that it's, it's not the focal length I would, I would prefer to use personally. Um, something pretty good that I've been recommending a few of my students recently because I've been doing um, like one-on-one -on -one session webinars and a few people have asked me about like um, ideas for projects or ideas for practice. I think a great thing to do with a longer lens, if you take your 90, set it to two meters because two meters is currently the, the kind of guidelines on distancing for people, set it two meters and then just shoot a whole roll of film or SD card or whatever you can fill up fastest at two meters on a 90 and see what you can produce from that and see whether that means that you're thinking within that range and then work at three meters and then work at five meters and eventually you'll figure out, oh, so all of these things are happening at five meters from me. So I'm gonna basically figure out what that distance is and know how to be at that distance when there's a potential situation. Because I think it, it comes from, um, I used to play around a bit with kind of 3D design software and I could, I'm having the freedom to you can move the camera in physical space around an object so you can you have to pre-visualize what something's going to look like and then put the camera there and figure it out you can kind of do that in real life by going okay so you know i'm in my bedroom i've got stuff over there i've got some boxes if i would stand here what would i look like on the other side of that obstacle could i use that as foreground or you know by by thinking about what the elements are you can figure out where you can position yourself so that you know what something else is going to look like from that position. So you already find yourself moving into these places before you need to be there. And then you just take the shot. But that takes a lot of practice. Oh, um, a good tip. So yeah, let's, I'll stop hogging the questions. There's, there's quite a few now, so. No, your, yours are good questions. <laughs> Sam, um, it's, Sam's got a good question. So he's saying, how do you recreate the intimacy of street photography when using longer length lenses, which will be lost by not using 28, 35, 50 mil lenses? Um, so, 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 sorry, so the question is that he thinks that intimacy is, is lost or you reduced. Use intimacy basically with a longer lens. Um, no, I think that you can take incredibly intimate photographs from miles away, and you can also take incredibly detached images from, from inches away. I don't think that the physical proximity has necessarily anything to do with the intimacy of the moment. I think that um, if, if that is having an influence, then it will be down to you keeping distance from your subject, assuming that the lens is gonna give you reach rather than moving in, figuring out the scene, figuring out the moment. And if it's intimate, if it's an intimate moment, it'll be an intimate moment from over there or from over there or from over there. It's not about being up in someone's face wide. Just being near someone doesn't mean that you're being intimate with someone, um, which is, I think, great relationship advice as well. Um, but, but specifically for the lens, I, I don't think that, you know, um, possibly if you look at the image on the right, I don't think there's a way that I would have taken that photograph with a wider lens that would have been less intimate. Like you're, you're, in, you're in that frame, you know? There's nothing that's taking you away from what's going on there, from the, from the faces, from the eyes, um, from the expression, from the hand, all of those things, I think, I think, you know, I think they work great. I don't, I don't think that I would look to choose a different piece of kit if I specifically want to tell an intimate story I would just figure out where I was going to position myself that's that's more important yeah. sorry that was quite a long answer yeah. that's also what you say like sometimes you're actually working in the same distances as you would with a 50 mil lens and with that longer lens you just you know you're cropping in tighter and pulling out uh, uh, you know a detail for example 
for sure. But it doesn't necessarily need, yeah, you, you don't, just because you have a 19, it could give you a detail, doesn't mean you can't also take a step back and, and take the wider scene as well. You can do both. Yeah. I've, I've heard, um, um, I can't remember who mentioned it um, before, that one of the reasons why these longer lenses kind of gradually faded out of it was because of the population increasing. And it, it became, for, for, particularly for things like street and stuff, it became more difficult to, to get a clean image. Um, because there was so many people around. So the wider lens, you know, made it easier to be closer and get the characters that you wanted to frame up rather than getting accidental people walking into your frame. Hmm. Well, I think that's an interesting one because I think with 28 mil, the people I most associate with that lens are like Winogrand, Meyerowitz, um, Bruce Gilden, and like Dido Moriyama. And those are, you know, they operate in New York and Japan, which are very, you know, densely populated places. And with those wide lens, you are getting these, it's that kind of stacked layering of people. Whereas when you look at the kind of Saul lighter work with a 90, you're looking at like a, a big foreground or, or some piece of the, of the, uh, the light or, you know, of, of the scene of the situation. And then you've got the people as kind of context. Um, I think you can have a balance. I think that it's difficult to shoot a crowd, you know, with, with this one on the right with the, um, I think the, the Navy cadet. Um, it, it's still a few people, but you're, I was focusing on one person waiting for them to, he was, he's turning around to like check in on his family to make sure they're still watching the drills, I think. Um, uh, breaking formation. But everything else is context for that. So it's just about the one character. Whereas on the left, you've got lots of characters, but they're not as, you know, you can't tell much about them uh, as much as you can about the, the boy on the right. So when you're, when you're working with situations with crowds, it is very much about picking out one or two people these are still quite fairly clean images, um, but it's not about those huge kind of vistas of faces and activity, like the, the kind of Myra with the yeah. space, use of space. But I, I don't think that, um, I don't think I've ever been particularly worried about people walking into my frame or, or stepping in. Um, the, the range finder makes it very easy because you've got so much space around the frames. You, you know if, something, if someone's gonna ruin it and you can, um, you know, accommodate for that and move in and, and stop that from happening. But I also think that because it is so small, you can just kind of twitch the frame aside and take your shot if something is going to ruin it quickly. Makes sense. Um, Watchtex asking, what is the longest effective telephoto lens that can be used on an M6 or MP? Uh, unless you want to use a Visiflex, which is an entirely different conversation, uh, I'd go for a 135 with a with a um, magnification aid that you can screw into the into the eyepiece. Um, I think that you can use 90 comfortably on all cameras, which is why I just really enjoy it. Uh, but 135 would be as long as you can go realistically um, without having to bring in some other piece of tech. Yeah. Um, Amanda's asking whether we can get a copy of the, the PDF. Um, I can send that to you, sure. Yeah, thank you. And oh yeah, as always, also recording of the of the webinar. Uh, I, I keep my slideshows fairly minimal, though. It's just about the the kind of accompanying images. The main the main stuff is is what I talk about. Yeah, Anthony is asking: With your ninety millimeter, do you have a favorite aperture setting for most street work? Would you have the same setting using a seventy five mil millimeter, which he does? Yes, I would, um, because it's about the exposure, not the look of the lens. I'll, just because you can make a creative image using thin depth of field doesn't mean that that's my priority. My priority is to make an exposure that, that shows what's going on, which means that I'll normally be exposed for the shadows because highlights are very well retained with film. So usually I'll be walking around along, um, uh, if, we, if we go based along the sunny 16 rule, if I've got 400 speed in my camera, and I've got my 90, it'll be F16 if I'm shooting subjects which are in the sunlight, or it'll be at F8 to F4 if I'm in the shadow, which means that on like an overcast British city day, I'll normally be around F4, um, and I'll just shoot everything at that. Great, I mean, there's a couple of questions kind of coming, uh, related to that coming up. Um, so yeah, do you typically use faster films when using tele lenses? Uh, I've actually started doing that, yes. I'll either push HP5 or pull um, Delta 3200. And I think that having that extra um, 
having those extra few stops are pretty useful, especially when I want to stop down for deep depth of field images. I know this one on this frame, the foreground is quite clear, quite in, very much in focus, but I have to stop down to about F16 in order to get those people in the background in focus as well. And I think this was on HP5 at 1600, but I might be wrong. But it's probably that. 1600. Yep, 1600. And then stand develop and everything's fine. Oh, remarkably clean. Yep. If you, if you stand develop, that means you're using a very low dilution. So like one to 100 for an hour and you only do an agitation at the beginning and end and like maybe a, a small one in the middle and you, you get much cleaner results. You could try it in the, uh, in the Leica dark rooms that don't exist yet. <laughs> okay, let me see. Um, Des is asking, do you up your speed significant, significantly for the 19 and the 135 to avoid camera shake? No, not at all. Um, I've shot the 90 at, you know, from, from one eighth of a second, maybe one fourth of a second, but you have to have very steady hands. And usually for that, I'll kind of be panning for motion. So my subject will be moving, I'll move with them. Um, I don't worry too much about camera shake, especially with film. And I think that some of the best, I think people talk a lot about the Leica look. I actually personally think that a lot of those images which have the lighter look actually have a little bit of motion blur and that adds to that kind of kind of halation haloing of, of the subject uh, so I think that motion blur is a is a benefit to images not a not a distraction so shoot with whatever is is comfortable for you but I wouldn't specifically raise my speed just for the sake of, of potentially shaking the camera yeah that's me no I agree, I agree with that as well I mean I've used up to the 90 probably been the longest I've used and I've never thought about increasing my shutter speeds. I've never felt the need to. I felt like I can handle all down to the same speeds. Um, but yeah. You lift weight, so that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's Anthony asking? So, Simon, you're talking about being ready for a situation which arises. My question is that do you sometimes find you're losing context when you're using a longer lens than, say, a 35 or a 50? No, not at all. Um, and I think the reason for that is because I don't believe, um, I don't really believe in, in telling an entire story in one image. I think that um, using diptychs, which I've done a, a webinar on, which is in what I think that using a, a sequence of images will be much more effective at telling a story. If you try and cram it all into one image, you'll, even if you include everything you want to include, you won't be telling the whole story with context. The best stories are told with context over time in multiple images, which means if something's going on and it's a wide scene, I'm happy to take lots of little details and then a wide shot and then an overarching shot and then an action shot and stitching all of those together and that will tell the story. Um, but I don't stress out about not including one thing in an image because I can always include it in another unless three things are happening at once and I can only be at one place at a time, in which case I know that I'm not the only photographer who will be working so I can reach out to any photographer who might have captured that scene and then we can collaborate on a diptych which tells the rest of the story. But that's a, a good stress-free way of doing it. I think it's very zen. <laughs> good. Um, yeah, that's, I find figure ground relationship is one of the aspects I focus the most on using the 90 minute Cinecron. What other aspects should one keep in mind? In terms of composition, so figure to ground means that you have a strong definition between subject and background. So this. Sorry, so this image that, um, that's currently loaded on screen, there's, you know, there's good definition between the legs and the sky and between the people and the background. But if, um, you know, if, if both of those characters, for example, were, were more highly exposed, they would be, they would kind of blend into the background and they'd be less clear. That, that's what figure to ground is. I think that in terms of aspects of things to look for, I don't, Figure to ground is an excellent one because it means that you're looking at things as if they're pieces of a puzzle which then click into place. Um, you know, the legs go here, the, the beam he's standing on goes here, and background goes there, people go there, it all clicks. Whereas if any of those things were, were kind of overlapping, it would be a very annoying thing to kind of, you have to figure it out. I think that happens a lot more with color images as well because you can have overlapping colors. Um, that's, a, that's a great thing to keep in mind compositionally, but I think that the most important thing is to identify 
you know, I'm, I'm not looking, I'm, I don't go out looking for figure to ground. I don't go out looking for rules of photography. I go out looking for situations and characters and moments. And once I have one piece of that, I'll move until that is, you know, is well grounded and then I'll shoot that. So I don't know that it's an aspect of composition that I'll be searching for. It'll just be whatever's interesting. That, that'll always be the most interesting aspect of what I'm searching for. And then everything compositional comes in later. And I don't think you can do much differently with a, with a long lens than a wide lens when it comes to composition, because it's just about, you know, arranging things in space by, by moving yourself continuously. Thank you. Um, another question from Watchdeck. Do telephoto lenses um, give a softer film-like look when compared with wide angle lenses? No, it's, it, it would be more about how you use it. I think that um, if you look at, uh, I, I think if you're, if you're going for the most modern setup of lenses and you go for the, uh, you know, the 35 Sonolux FLE, 50 APO, 75 APO, 90 APO, 135 APO, um, you know, if you really treat yourself, uh, then you'll pretty much have consistent results across the field. You won't necessarily see things differently if you're using the same film. I don't think there'll be a, 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 a spectacularly different rendering aside from when it comes to things like perspective and field of view and the depth. When it comes to the sharpness of what's in focus, um, you, you won't really see things differently. Uh, I think that there, there are, I know there, there's like the, the 90 sandbar, which is a special effect lens, which, which does give you kind of a softer Hollywood glow. Um, but just by nature of being longer, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a different look. It'll be, you know, down to the lens design that gives you the different look. Um, I actually think, uh, Robin, you said, you said earlier that um, you thought the longer lenses went out of fashion because, um, you know, places became more populated. So for street photography, they were, they were less desirable. Um, I, my, my understanding is that they were most commonly a, a portrait length because they were easier to, it's easier to correct the long lens for things like distortion. Um, but because technology improved, you can now get 50 millimeters, which, you know, don't distort, which, which give you a natural rendering. So people sort of didn't give themselves a 90 or a 135 in their arsenal which they would have usually used for a portrait length because they can now use a 50 to do a more diverse set of things. Um, but that's not really related to this question. <laughs> uh, good, good valid points. Um, Amanda, the question. Um, she's requesting a weekend workshop for film and using long lenses when we're more able to do such things. It'd be great to learn more about pushing and pulling film and how to communicate that as well as a, as well as to third party film processing services if you don't develop your own. Um, that's, that's very doable. Uh, where, when I have permission from the government to, to do such, um, such sessions, I think, I think I've discussed similar ideas. Um, there was a, a webinar a few weeks ago with David Babian, uh, who I mentioned earlier, who might be doing one on wide lenses. He did one on film development. Um, and I think I've discussed the possibility of teaming up with him to do a, you know, you go out, shoot with film, come back and develop. I think between us, we've got four or five development tanks, so we could bring all of those in, lend them to lend them to the students, and uh, and do a, a more hands-on thing, and 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 deal with things like stand development and ultimate processing. Um, but that's a nice idea in theory. Yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll see how well it can come together in practice. On the ideas board, and for when things do calm down. <laughs> Um, there's a few questions as well that I'll look at in the comments feed and then we'll come back to the Q&A panel. There's still more to go. Uh, so where do we go back to? It's well, there's quite a lot of questions that, that were coming up in the comments feed actually. Um, main advantage of having a 90 over a, a 50? Um, so for me personally, it's easier to see the frame lines because I wear glasses. Um, it gives you that couple of steps more uh, in terms of reach. It gives you uh, kind of a more surgical strike on exactly one thing that you want. I really think that with a 90 mil, you're looking at one thing and then add the next thing and then add the next thing and then piece those things together. Whereas with a 35, it's like everything and you get it in one rather than finding one thing, then the next thing, then the next thing. So with this image, you know, um, you find the person balancing on the beam and then you wait for the two people underneath to pass by and then those elements come together. 
whereas with the 35, it would be him and everyone else on the beam and everyone else on the beach. Uh, or with, um, you know, with this image on the left, you'd have a lot more of the buildings with a 50 rather than, you know, I really wanted those people in the foreground with that scooter that's been discarded and then the layers working backwards. Um, with this, so, so it's, it's not necessarily about removing context, but it's about being more specific about what you want to include. The 90 is a more discretionary lens. Um, you know, the, the longer you go, the more discretionary you can become, which doesn't mean you can't do the same thing with a wider lens, but it means you have to look for very different things just naturally as a result of the way space works around you. Good. And just as a follow up question to that from Laura as well. Um, in fact, there were a couple of follow up questions. Um, which one is better for streets? Um, 90 better for festivals, while 90 um, for the intimate close ups? Question mark. So uh, I, I don't believe in better. I, I always think, you know, there's better than what, better for what. Um, depending on the kind of street photography you want to do, if it's kind of architectural, you can do excellent work with a 90, you can do excellent work with a 24. If it's for, you know, intimate, close faces in a crowd, you can do excellent work with a 24, you can do excellent work with a 90. All, all ends of the spectrum are great. It's about how you decide to apply them. So um, I know it's kind of a cop-out answer, but you kind of just have to try different things and experiment and trial and error and, and figure out what works for you. Because if I say, because, you know, I love 90, so I'm biased, I would say 90, David would say 28. Um, he would be wrong. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, it's, it's excellent if you decide to put in the practice and use it for, for the application you want to use it for. You know, you, you, um, you can get adapters which make an, a 90 into a macro lens and use macro work, and you can do the same for 24. You know, it's about how you decide to use it. Um, in terms of the question for festival use, I think that's a bit specific. Um, because again, it depends whether you're photographing the festival crowd or the band or the context of what's going on. Um, I've only photographed a few festivals and I used, uh, I think I had 40, 50 and 90 for some reason. Um, and I mainly used 50 and 90. And I think for the, for the scenes um, where I was photographing kind of the tents and the mornings and the evenings, uh, I was using the 50 more for, for a bit more context. And then when I was in the, the real crowds at the music performances, I was using a 90. Um, and that gave me, you know, an, a nicer effect to kind of pick things out of the crowd rather than photographing the crowd as a subject. It would be a piece of the crowd. Hope that helps. Yeah, that's very helpful, I think. Um, good question from Alan. Are you using the 90 F2 APO for the quality or for the wide aperture? Are you often shooting wide open? Uh, both. I think the, the, I used to like in the summer, it's very nice to just put in some 50 or 100 speed film and shoot at f2 and just shoot in the sunlight. But in the, you know, when it comes to, to the winter and the autumn, when there's less available light and I'm using four to 800 speed, um, then I'll be using the wide aperture as a light gathering thing. But it's not necessarily about the look because you're going to get incredible fall off at all apertures. Like even, even if you shoot at f16 on a 90 and you're taking a portrait, it's still just going to be the eyes in focus and nothing else because of because of the closeness. Um, so it's it's not necessarily about the look or the depth of field. It's more about the, the ability to gather as much light as possible in the lightest form factor, which is the F2. I know that the 1.5 offers a little bit more, um, but it also offers that little bit more weight, which for me um, isn't isn't something I would I would compromise with. Good. Thank you. Um, what was the next question? Um, from uh, Jose, I use a Vario Elmar R F uh, 1.4 70 to 210 millimeter with an Overflex R to M adapter with um, his M240. Is it diff very difficult to focus with the rangefinder? I usually do it with the EVF and color aid, as in the focus peaking. Um, can you comment on that? Um. Unless I'm misunderstanding, I would say it's not just difficult to focus. It would be impossible because there's no rangefinder coupling with that lens and an adapter. Um, so the, the only thing to do would be to use the EVF and, and like focus peaking. Um, depending on what you're using it for, you can also try 
like using the zone focusing scale to focus at different distances. But if it's for fast paced use, um, I'd probably recommend just putting that lens back on a like an R6.2 and, and using it on film. Um, but I think there, there are options um, for using kind of 200 mil on, an, on a 240, but, but they would involve, you know, getting, getting it, um, you know, specially adapted so you can move the focusing ring faster, for example. But I, but I wouldn't, it's not a setup I would personally use for anything other than like landscape or wildlife. And actually, one you you probably already know this, um, Ted Joseph. But if you if you're shooting on your MT40 and you put the the preview in black and white, it might just help see the the peaking a little bit more more easily. Because obviously, if you're shooting the raw file, you'll still get the the color file to process later. But I know a lot of people do use that um, trick. Sorry. Um, John's asking, would you recommend the use of an EVF? With a longer lens, um, so I've used the EVF with my digital M's, and I think that's good when I'm when I'm doing things like fashion work. Um, but when it comes to fast pace use, I much prefer just having the rangefinder because then it's either it's almost binary. It's either yes, this is in focus, or no, it isn't, and then you move it until it is. Whereas with uh, an SLR, where you're uh, an SLR system with the EVF, where you're looking through the lens. Um, I think it, that kind of lends itself to a lot more fine tuning and tweaking and really kind of minute little details. Whereas with the rangefinder, it's like, boom, done, take the photo. Doesn't really matter if it's massively in or out of focus as long as it's there. And that's what, that's what I'm going for. Uh, whereas if you're going to do something slower paced, like you've got fashion work where, uh, like if it's a run white and they're hitting their mark every time, you can just focus on that mark once and never need to touch the camera again, except for clicking the shutter. Um, if it's a landscape where you, you, you know, you can use it as a kind of waist level finder with the EVF, all of those things are great. Um, but for the fastest situations, nothing beats a rangefinder. For me. Um, oh yeah. So have you ever used the 90 Elmerit? And if so, what's your view on it? Yes, uh, that was my first 90, uh, which I sold to get the F2. Uh, Apo, and I also have the the kind of compact uh, 90mm f4, which came out with the CL, uh, the film CL. Um, I don't think there are any bad lenses. Um, I, I think they're all excellent. You'll do perfectly well with the 90 Elmer at 2.8, unless you find yourself needing that extra stop. Um, but in terms of the look of the lens, I, I think they're I think they're all fantastic. Great. And I'm not actually sure what a mirror lens is. Do you know what a mirror lens is? Yep, it's uh, only well, nerds use those. Yeah. Uh, Hans is asking, what do you think about using a mirror lens, eight to five hundred millimeter, on the Leica M with an EVF? Um, the high ISO. Um, oh, sorry. Follow the high the high ISO range of the newest digital Leica M allows even hand photography without a tripod. Yeah. Um, you you can probably adapt uh, mirror so a mirror lens is, is a lens but on the front it'll have like a little dot and that, and that reflects back into it which means it's kind of, it's it's almost like a um like how a telescope reflects mm -hmm. along the inside it's it's kind of doing that which means that you can have like an 800 mil that's that big because it's it's not it doesn't need to reach but those will only um the trick with those is, is, is that it's a fixed aperture normally around 5.6 to f8 so like f11 so you get one focal length, one aperture, and then everything else, you know, you change the shutter speeds to accommodate. I, I think that it would be interesting to try one of those with an M. Uh, it would definitely be possible because you can get them in most SLR mounts and then adapt it. Um, and yes, the, the high ISO range would definitely uh, negate needing a tripod for that kind of thing. Um, so if you do use a mirror lens, please send me the results and I'll be interested to see that. I'm intrigued now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Des massively agrees about doing a 90 workshop with um, film suggestions. Great, I'll see you there. <laughs> um, Robert Hughes, is the magnifier for the viewfinder an essential accessory for the 7590 with users who wear glasses and have difficulty focusing the rangefinder? I, I, I think it is. I think, it, it, I think it's important. It's not one I personally use just because um, 
it's because it, it's a little bit longer and, and I don't know that it's as um, I, I, I tend to kind of smash my camera into my face when I'm ready and I've got massively scarred glasses as a, re as a result. Um, so I think it is essential, but if you tend to like move erratically like I do, then uh, it might go in your eye. So that's a weird thing to, to think about. You'll probably be fine. Um, I definitely try out. I think uh, most like a showrooms will have the magnification accessory to try out. So if you have your camera, take it in, you know, try both out. Um, take some portraits of the lovely staff, which is what I always do to annoy them. Um, and then uh, make your decision based on whether it's easier for you, uh, for sure. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think I find that people either love the magnifier or hate them. Um, I've tried them a couple of times and I just don't like something protruding at the back of the range find that puts me off. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, it's odd, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think this is the last question um, done well. So Barth is asking um, a good question. Most of your sub most of your pictures um, here seem to be where you've had a chance to, to focus. So you were able to use a telephoto lens. Would you still use these lenses if you were doing street photography when the subject was on the move? Yes. So, um, so for that, I'll, I, I'll usually use um, either pre-focusing where I pick a spot where I know they're going to be and focus on that, or I just use the rangefinder and move with them. I think, let me find, um, so this one, uh, obviously that's a huge crowd walking towards me. So I'm walking backwards as I'm photographing. Uh, for this one, because she's just behind the main banner they were carrying at the front, I had to run in, move backwards. I had to run into frame and then move backwards at the same rate as they were moving towards me in order to take the photograph. So I focus first and then just keep walking so I can see that it's in focus, frame and then shoot. Um, for this one on the left, you can actually see that I've had to duck down. He's being hoisted up by the crowd. So these, all of the, the foreground is, is people's heads looking up at him. So I'm in the crowd with them and I think I had to lean backwards on one leg kind of leaning into the person behind me to photograph um, you can actually see that it's I missed the focus on his eye it's actually just behind his head um, on the, the kind of flag cape he's wearing um, but it, it's close enough that I'm fine with it and I think that was at f2 so yeah it'll just be about oh. moving yourself into a position where the frame is around your subject you, you've got what you want to photograph in the frame and then as they move, you move around with them um, and then click whenever you're comfortable. I was actually just about to ask, like, do you only ever use that technique when you're stopping down to like eight, 11 or smaller? No, no. So uh, this was short of that too. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, like it's, it's, it's in enough that the image exists, but it's just out of focus enough that, you know, pixel people still like, oh, you missed it. It's like, no, I got the image, but it's not you know, it's not a histogram, um, it's, a, it's an exposure. Uh, and the same with the one on the right, the, the person with the umbrella is walking that way and I kind of had to run up frame and then take a step as he took a step so that I could get him within the frame that I wanted him in rather than a step further. So yeah, um, if, you can, if you can track the motion of whatever's moving around you, uh, it's, it's usable for sure. Fantastic, we did it. I think we've got through all the, all the questions there. Uh, Great, perfect. Yeah, well, if you've got any comments, please send them through. Uh, Miguel, I just noticed, said, yeah, well, he's a, he's a fan of the 1.25 magnifier, even on his um, 50 millimeter, on his M6. Perfect. Yeah, so yeah, thank you again. I found that very interesting myself. Um, and actually, yeah, glad to hear it. Yeah, I feel um, inclined to try out, a, yeah, as you say, a 75 or a 90 next time I go shooting. So yeah, thank you again. Um, as always, I'll send a follow-up email with a recording once it's finished um, processing and also, um, as you mentioned, Simon's kindly going to give a PDF of the presentation, which I'll also attach to the follow-up email. Um, yep. yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, thank you all. You all not seeing you on another webinar. <laughs> yep, I've got another one coming up later this month um, on the portfolios. Okay. Yeah, what is that about? Uh, that'll be on producing a portfolio. So whether you are looking to um, take a, a body of work that you've already created or you're looking to create a body of work with a specific purpose of using it for a portfolio, I'll be talking about not, not exactly what to include, but 
what the, what what its purpose is, how to actually think about what you're using a portfolio for, and then putting that together. Um, and then after that, uh, I'll be holding more portfolio review sessions as I have in the past, but I'll I'll be referring people to that webinar so that they can put something together for me to look at. Actually, and you will mention it, but I'll mention it. From your previous portfolio sessions, we had rave, rave feedback coming through. So they're, they're obviously very good. Wonderful. I, I do remember the rave feedback, yeah. That was nice. <laughs> um, and then I think I've also got a, a, a webinar coming up on semiotics as well. Um, and that should be fairly interesting. I think some of the things I discussed here in terms of what I'm looking for, that I'm not looking for kind of rules of photography, but that I'm looking for stuff, That'll be covered in in the uh, in the semiotics webinar. So I'll I, I'm not sure if we've picked a date for that one, but that'll be coming up soon. Yeah, well, I think that one I'm not sure if it's online yet. If it's not, it's soon to be published online. It's all it's all with the web team. <laughs> cool. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much, Simon. Great. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.